Hey, you have Patrick Fendaro here, co-founder at Vetted Biz. Uh, excited to have on Josh Marks. Josh practices corporate, franchise, and real estate law. Um, Josh, thanks so much for joining thanks, today. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to it. So tell me a little bit how you entered the, what, what drove you to become a lawyer and how did you enter this niche of supporting would-be and current small business owners? Well, becoming a lawyer is a long story. It was pretty much accidental. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do in, in college. And I had a connection to do an internship for a judge in Philadelphia toward the end of my college career. And I sat in court every day and I really enjoyed it. And she kind of nudged me to go to law school. So it kind of went in that direction very quickly. Um, and in the early part of my career, I, I did everything. I was sort of a general practitioner. I did litigation, criminal defense, real estate. And, and I really enjoyed going to court. But as you can imagine, it gets, it gets tiring battling every day. I needed something a little more positive. And uh, I really enjoyed doing transactional work. And so I wanted to pick a niche. And so we kind of focused the firm uh, from that point on in the transaction space, you know, commercial real estate, uh, business acquisition and sales. And now we've expanded into the franchising world. Interesting. I can imagine there's a lot of similarities because like most people buying a business of the size, it's usually an asset sell. So you're not assuming, uh, hopefully you're not That's assuming right. like a lot of the bad liabilities. And I would imagine the That's structure right. would be somewhat similar to if you're buying a commercial property. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of similarities in terms of what you have to do to get to the closing table, due diligence, your homework, uh, some of the contracts and transaction documents that are involved. So there, there's a lot of good overlap there for sure. And there are, you know, quite a lot of franchises that are doing a, a business that doesn't really require a physical presence, whether that be a home service brand. Um, but even if when you scale and you have a home service brand and you go from two to 30 employees, like you're generally going to need a home base, same thing for home health care. And obviously there's a lot of businesses like education um, and, and food that require a physical presence from day one. So obviously revising the lease terms and all that negotiation you right. can help with too. Yeah. And you know, and as, as these businesses grow, just like you said, Patrick, there's, there's a whole host of challenges just in the growth when you're in the growth mode. Um, so we get called upon frequently by our, cl our clients to address those issues that they face, which are kind of always evolving over time. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, some of the most common legal challenges that small business owners face um, and, and how they can better prepare for those, those issues. Sure. So it's funny. I, I would say most of the challenges we see our clients having aren't even what I would term legal. I would say they're more Things like lack of experience would be one, right? Is and especially now you're seeing a lot of people choosing the franchising because they want to exit the corporate world, yes. and so they see this as an opportunity to be their own, their own, you know, an entrepreneur and their own boss. And so a lot of people who get into this space don't necessarily have operating experience. And um, so even though that's part of the appeal, I think of a franchise is well. I may not have operating experience, but this franchisor is going to show me how to run this business. And that's true to some extent. There's still, you have to go out and execute. So that lack of management experience, uh, lack of experience handling marketing or looking at financials can all come into play and affect your ability to, to, to really succeed. So I'd say that's, that's one area. Um, lack of capital is another area that I see a lot. People think that if they can just you know, get that SBA loan and they have enough for their portion that's required to be put into the deal, then they're good to go, but they don't leave themselves a cushion at all. So I think that's always a big issue. That's, and that's a, that's a huge that's problem. That's something that comes up time after time when I interview existing franchisees have had a business five, 10 years. They're like, you got to prepare for the rainy day. Don't rely on PPP loans and make sure you have sufficient capital to exactly. draw down as there's going to be business fluctuations yes. and you don't want to shut your doors if, if, if it was just another two months of, of working capital that could have kept the lifeline on. No, exactly. Exactly, because you have to remember, you have all these obligations as a franchisee. So the franchisor is expecting payments every month. You have a landlord who's expecting rent payments every month. And you may have a bank that's expecting loan payments every month. So you have to have the whole financial piece really figured out. And I think that's where some people fall short. Um, so the, the, uh, what I was going to add to that is um, you know, lack of due diligence, which to me means somebody rushing into a venture. They haven't properly vetted, you know, not only the franchisor, if, if it's a franchise, right? 
not only vetting the franchisor, but doing things like, you know, what's the marketplace for this product or service? Is it a growing market? What, who are my competitors out there? Uh, what's, what's the true cost of opening up and, and ongoing? Um, so I think those are a lot of things where people kind of fall short because they're, they're rushing to get a territory or rushing to acquire what they think is a good deal. Um, so go ahead, there's I'll a lot of FOMO and yeah, it's a big thing that we want to do at vetted biz is like change the buying of a franchise or buying of an existing business to be less of an emotional experience and more of like a financial. And I, I see that as comparing to residential real estate, much more emotional, how you're going to live in the house and how it looks. And it's an emotion. It's more of an emotional decision. It should be financial, but it's more emotional where commercial real estate, it's about the numbers and it's not really an emotional right. decision to buy that uh, plot at land, that triple net uh, property. It's purely financial. There's minimal emotions tied to that commercial right. property, especially if you're not yeah. occupying the space with your business. Yeah. I, you know, I tell people you have to be willing to walk away. You, you can't get so wrapped up within your heart uh, that it, it clouds your judgment, especially when you have so much on the line financially. So you have to be willing to walk away sometimes. And surprisingly, the, the one other thing I wanted to add that I see people fall short on is actually having a good professional team in their corner. I can't tell you how many times I speak to someone who's ready to spend three, four hundred thousand dollars to launch a franchise and they don't even have an accountant. <laughs> they have no accountant relationship. They don't have an attorney. They don't have a business advisor. So they're going really, they're flying blind on a lot of key things. Um, so I, I stress to people, you got to have your team in place. Don't cut corners, you know, because you don't want to spend a few extra dollars to pay these people. These are the people that you need to protect you. That's super well said. And I, I don't know if my colleague Maria mentioned, but I, I wrote a book, How to Buy a Franchise, Josh. And number three is your trusted advisors. And I advocate the number one non-negotiable one is the attorney. And then after that, you have accountant, you can have a franchise broker, consultant, business broker, if it's buying an, exist an existing um, uh, franchise resale potentially. Um, and then there's other advisors, like if you want to work with a, uh, a loan broker or a financing consultant, those are all optional, but you need an attorney. And with Visa Franchise, our, our consultant and advisory arm, the only conflicts that I've seen that have gone to the legal stage with demand letters, lawsuits, whatever, there's been few uh, out of maybe 600 clients. We've had maybe four. All those clients, despite us saying you need a franchise attorney, chose not to engage a franchise attorney and rushed to the decision and had issues down the line. So I, I can't advocate enough that you need to have a franchise attorney. And again, with our sample size, we've, we've had hundreds of, of clients where it's gone really sour is where they didn't fully understand the legal obligations of that contract that they were signing for 10 years and exactly from legal sense, what the franchisee is doing and what the franchisor is doing. And that's got to come from a, an attorney that is well versed in franchising law. A hundred percent. I'm going to use that as a marketing soundbite on my website if I can. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of yes, the well, issues you mentioned that were more operational or more financial can, it can be a, a, a vicious cycle where if you haven't manage people on your own as a small business owner and you don't know how to best treat employees and you've been in a different environment, maybe you never had employees. If you're not treating people well, it's like that doctor who's not nice to his patients. He's going to get sued a lot more than the doctor that's very empathetic to his clients, to his uh, right. employees. And those kind of mistakes on the operational and management side can become legal issues where if you are if you already have the experience and the know-how, you're much less likely to, to have legal issues um, just based on, on the experience and knowing how to properly run a business. That's true. And I, and I think that's where it becomes important for people to get, it's sometimes you need a, an impartial you know, third party to kind of help you with the process, but certainly skills that you have in your day-to-day -day job will translate over to running a business and running a franchise. You just have to figure out what skills you have that translate and what skills yeah. you don't have that you're going to need someone to help you with. And that That's someone could be part of the franchise or when you get up and going, um, but that someone most likely is going to be an outside advisor, especially before you sign on the dotted line, the franchise yeah. agreement, the franchise or wants you to sign up. They want you to pay the franchise fee. They want your royalties. 
So it's good having that impartial advisor. No doubt. Absolutely necessary. And so what are some ways that you help franchisees negotiate favorable terms with the franchisors? Uh, and what are some common, yeah, some common areas that you, you can negotiate that, that franchise agreement on? So that's a good question. Um, cause you know, the first, the tagline that you're going to get from the franchisor is we don't negotiate our franchise agreement. That's the, the they all say that. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think to some extent it's true in the sense that there are certain things they are not going to negotiate, right? If everybody in the system is paying a 6% royalty, <laughs> you're not going to get a 5% royalty, right? They're not going to do that. But things like we find that things like time frames are negotiable. So you want to try to maybe buy your clients some more time to do things like site selection, lease negotiation, build out of space. Because the franchisor wants you to get up and running within a certain period of time, but some franchisors are willing to give you a little bit of a buffer, again, because so much of that process is out of the franchisee's control to some extent. Um, you might be dealing with a difficult landlord who's not responsive. You might be dealing with trouble in that particular municipality getting construction permits, and that could take a long time. So there's things that are out of control. We try to negotiate a buffer on things like timeframes. Um Things like training, maybe you can try to ask the franchisor if you can get some additional key personnel trained at no additional cost. So something like that, we'll try to so see that, if we can that, negotiate. You can earn your keep with um, that because, I mean, that could be 2K, 3K yeah, plus. Very expensive, right? So that that's worth its weight in gold right there. Um, and you know, another thing that comes to mind would be something like um, minimum royalty payments. Trying to push back, you know, obviously if the, if the franchisee is not performing, you don't want them to have to pay. So maybe there's some negotiating room there, or maybe the franchisor will at least give you, you know, give us 12 months. Let us get up and running for 12 months before you hit us with some sort of minimum royalty, just so we can get, you know, get on our feet and start making some money. So there's, there's things like that that we look to see if we can, you know, write a first refusal on adding additional territories, things like that. So we look to try to negotiate things like that with the franchisor. So yeah, essentially the the right of first refusal protects your hard-earned capital and it doesn't necessarily require that you have some aggressive development cycle where maybe that franchise brand's not exactly what you want. There's a lot of franchises, like I've interviewed people from Massage Envy that they had to develop those subsequent units, but knowing what they knew after the first six months of the first location, they wouldn't have opened up a second or a third if it wasn't part of the right. legal agreement. Exactly. You're right. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a relationship that has to really develop and mature over time. I think both sides want to see how the other side performs uh, before they really start instituting rapid growth for that particular franchisee. So, yeah. Can you discuss some of the legal requirements that franchisors and franchisees need to be aware of to one, avoid conflict? So that initial conflict, and then even worse, avoid potential litigation. Well, so from the franchisor side, I think that the first thing that is obvious is the FDD, right? The franchise disclosure document, which a franchisor is required to have and provide to a franchisee. Uh, it's, you know, typically very comprehensive. Some of them can be 200 to 300 pages long, and um, it's got to have certain disclosures in there, You know, things like the, the financials, the fr franchisor's financials, uh, whether or not the franchisor has had any recent litigation, any bankruptcy filings, um, who their list of current franchisees are, all those sorts of things, right? So first and foremost, a franchisor may, needs to make sure that their FDD is up to date and compliant. Then they have to worry about there's several states that actually require that that FDD, well, there's two things. There's a, close to 15 states that require a franchisor actually register in that state before they can offer a franchise for sale in that state. So if a franchisor is going to be in one of those states, they have to register first. So they got to make sure their attorney gets them registered. Then there's other states that don't require that registration, but that do require the actual FDD document be filed with the state. So those are sorts of, those are the, from the franchisor side, those are the things that they need to be aware of. And you really need to have franchisor counsel on an ongoing basis yearly, updating the FDD and making sure everything's compliant and all the jurisdictions that they're operating in. You know, from the franchisee side, they want to thoroughly go through that FDD, right? They want to, and, and that's where 
hopefully legal counsel comes in, which is one of the services we provide. And I'm not just saying that for our benefit. I, you know, I would, and someone presents me with a 300 page document. <laughs> I would hope that, you know, you're going to want to review that before you sign on the dotted line um, because there's so Especially much Especially that's non-standard. In it's not like a Florida yeah. template for lease or buying a residential right. property. These are non, right. I mean, there's items and what is it? One to 22 or one to 23. And yeah, it follows, but it's not like right. plug and play. Like you're leasing a property where all the, the language is the same. It's just a basic uh, format that needs to be followed. So exactly, and and every franchisor is in a different situation, right? So you won't know the specifics that pertain to that franchisor unless you go through the FDD, and then and the franchise agreement, which is usually contained as an exhibit within the FDD, is your contractual obligations. That's your contract with the franchisor, and you're going to really want to go through that to see what your obligations are, what your rights are. Bigger picture, you know, how do I get it? Can I get out of this if it's not going well? What if I want to sell my franchise? Um, all those sorts of things. What am I personally on the hook for if things don't go well? So that's where I think an experienced franchise attorney can really add value. And legally, if you don't go through that with a fine tooth comb ahead of time, you're setting yourself up for some problems down the line. And I've interviewed multiple franchisees on our channel at Vetted Biz. And again, the ones that had serious conflict uh, did not have a, a franchise attorney. And one of them signed a franchise agreement that was for 20 years. And after wow. two years, the business just wasn't working. The business model didn't actually make that much sense. A very high default rate on SBA loans for that set franchise. And the franchise award did not negotiate with them and and basically wanted the full 18 years left of the minimum oh, royalty gosh. payment, which might've wow. been a thousand or $1,500 a month. So, you know, I, just using an That's accountant, yeah, just using an accountant to go through that or just by yourself. Um, it really needs to be an attorney to understand as it's not, you're not buying like a stock that it can go to zero. You're, you're, you're investing in a business that you can have serious down liability and it doesn't just go to zero, but it can go negative 50K, 100K, 200K, 500K, right. um, especially if you include in the real estate component and being on the hook for the lease, you know, giving personal guarantee. Um, so exactly. knowing what you're getting into, franchising can be an amazing uh, business model with the right franchisor, but really knowing what you're getting into, working with an advisor, as we just mentioned, can can save a lot of heartache down the line. Yeah, and, he, and it's perfectly said, Patrick. And, and what always... I. What baffles me is, you know, most attorneys that do this kind of work, are we on the same platform and FDD, we charge a flat fee. And most of the other attorneys we know that do these FDD reviews do the same. I can assure you that we are receiving the least amount of money of anyone that that franchisee is connected to in the deal. Involved They're paying the their process. bank more. Yes. They're going to pay more for their loan. They're going to pay more to the landlord. They're going to pay more to the franchisee. We're the ones getting the least amount of all this, yes. and yet we're the ones who could potentially really protect you. The so value. when someone's trying to, when someone wants to save a few thousand dollars by not hiring counsel, I, I'm always blown away by that decision. It's not a good business decision. Yeah, essentially, it, it's part of the insurance policy of of getting into a new new business venture, and that yeah. you'll really understand exactly. what what the risks are, and and you can negotiate some of the terms in, in your favor to avoid you know, other risk. Um, yeah. Josh, before and we one started- thing I wanted to add, if, just wanted to add one thing if I could, because I know there's a lot of prospective franchisees who listen to your podcast. A good place to start is um, if you go to ftc.gov, which is the Federal Trade Commission website, there is a guide on there, a consumer's uh, guide to buying a franchise. And so that could be a good resource for some of your listeners, just to kind of start getting some information on what to look for in buying a franchise and what kind of things they should consider before moving through the process. Very well said. And FTC, it's protecting you as a consumer, the prospective franchise buyer. I was at an event uh, conference in, in September, the Association of, of Franchisees and Dealers, and the head of one of the divisions of the FTC spoke. And it, they're enforcing actions on your behalf and they're educating you on what to avoid as they see so many scams and so many bad actors in the business opportunity space, whatever whatever arena is, is targeting uh, consumers in the United States. So it's really a wealth of information and 
one thing that we do, Josh, um, at Vetted Biz and, and our, our sister company, Visa Franchise, we do FOIA requests on franchise brands to uncover franchise complaints with the FTC. And a lot of people ah. don't know that the FTC, you can make a, a complaint to the FTC and they're also compiling complaints and legal action with another 30 different agencies. So law enforcement agencies, Better Business Bureau. So that's a good good thing to do. If you're looking to buy a franchise, spend the $40 uh, on the, the filing for the FOIA request with the FTC. And you can see every consumer complaint. And in those, it, it might also include, fran so the end consumer that might be getting ripped off by whatever product or service franchisees are selling as well as franchisees that might have bought that brand and got screwed over. Um, so I think that's a really good check. Um, and that was a bit of a tangent, but the FTC is is there to protect you as a consumer. And it is a great source uh, for information, yeah. as you, as you yes. mentioned with that guy that I'm familiar with, but also on FOIA requests for complaints against franchise brands. Yeah, definitely. All part of your due diligence, right? Digging in and finding out whatever you can about the franchisor. I think it's important that you have your advisors to help you, but you have to really have ownership in the process. And at the end of the day, it's if you're a prospective franchisee, it's you that are going to have to live with the consequences of your actions. So do as much as you can upfront and don't rush the decision. Josh, we we mentioned before we started the today's conversation that the average franchisee holds his franchise business for seven years. Now, he might sell for a nice exit. He might close down. The franchise war might buy back the business. Another out franchisee might buy it, uh, someone outside. Um, I was curious to hear if you had any success stories from clients you've worked with to, that built successful franchise businesses, or it could be even independent businesses um, that had that exit and, and, and had that success in their business that they sold for, for a nice profit from their initial investment. Yes, we've definitely had some of those, I'd say on the non-franchise side, um, not because there's anything wrong with our franchise clients. It's just all of our franchise clients still seem to be in the game right now. Sure. So, um, but, but certainly over the years, we've had plenty of sell side deals with clients that had businesses for many years and, you know, retired or, you know, could have been a, a family business, a generational business and the younger generation, you know, decided to exit for whatever reason. So, um, and those are always great deals to be a part of because it's, it's almost, a celebration because it's it's something they chose. It's not being forced yes. upon them and their years of hard work are finally paying off. So it's really nice to be a part of a deal like that. Um, but I would say those people that were able to do that really put the time in. It's more consistency than anything. I mean, yes, a lot of them were talented and good operators, but it was more or less just like anything in life, showing up every day, tweaking the business, constantly putting effort and energy into it, having a strategy, growing it, learning from mistakes. And then over the course of 10, 15 years, you've seen this business appreciate and grow and it makes, you know, it, it, it gains value so that you can actually find a buyer that wants to take it from there. We have a ton of data in terms of franchise resells and the values that they've actually closed on, the values that they're listed on, on business for sale sites like Biz Buy Sell. And if it's listed for a million, it's usually actually going to close at like 900K. There's usually a 10, 15% haircut to that. But sadly for a lot of franchises, the resale value is less than the initial investment costs. So like a Subway franchise might set you back right. 350K to open one, but they're being sold for like 150K, 200K. And a lot of franchises well, that's not, out that's there- That's not good math. I'm no, yeah. <laughs> I'm no expert. I'm no expert, but that doesn't seem like good math. You're just to not going to get your money back. And uh, yeah. it's sad because- Again, this is where I think the emotional versus like the analytical component needs to be firm where ask the franchise or ask franchisees when you're evaluating what the what recent resales have been. And if they're not higher than how much you're investing, they should be higher and at least 100K for all your hard time and the risk of starting a business yeah. from zero rather than acquiring an existing business or, or franchise. Right. And, and I think by and large, I think people need to really be multi-unit. If you want to make real money, you know, and, and I'm not certainly putting down somebody who's able to pull $100,000 out of their franchise and, and pay themselves that as a salary. That's fantastic. But I think a lot of people 
go into this thing thinking not just going to be a job, it's going to be an entrepreneurial endeavor. And I think if that's the way you're looking at it, you're going to really need to own multiple units to make that kind of money. And I, I, I just know from financials of my own clients yeah. and some that are doing great revenue and have very low overhead and have, are doing great revenue, still, it's just the way it works out. You know, you, if you really want to take it to another level, you're going to have to have multiple units, probably multiple units, territories. If it's like a home home service yeah. brand, but yeah, I, I fully agree. And a lot of franchisees I spoke with, they're leaving a corporate job at 200k, 250k, knowing that they're going to have to take a step back for that first right. location and take a step forward. Really, only when they're at two or three uh, locations, yes. where then then they're making EBITDA, th then they're making discretionary earnings back at the the quarter million. Um, but it's definitely a, a right. step back to take a step forward. But the difference between the corporate job is you have an asset now, and you can sell that for a nice capital gain, whether it's at, right. at five yeah. years, seven years, 10 years, or, or 20 years. That's right. Exactly. So that's the, that's the upside of doing something like this, for sure. Josh, do you have any concluding thoughts for for those that are, are listening, and I mentioned we have all different um, viewers and listeners, but a lot of them are prospective franchisees. You know, I I think going back to what we originally discussed, I you know, in any business endeavor like this, you have to do a lot of homework. So I would say, don't rush into it. You know, once you start the dialogue with a franchisor, many of them sort of put the pressure on to move you through their process quickly because they want to get you under contract and get your store opened. But their their time frame might not align with your time frame, or at least your ability to, to sufficiently do your homework. You need to talk to other franchisees to really understand how, if the system's working, if the infrastructure's there, if the support from the franchisor is there, that's part of it. You have to understand the financials. You have to understand the market and the opportunity, and you have to assemble your team, and all that takes time. So- for the franchisees out there, I would say that's the key, in my opinion, to really take time to do your homework. Uh, and for franchisor, uh, for franchisees that are established, and we didn't really touch on this, but I'll add quickly, that are looking to exit and sell, that's something that should be done. Your preparation for the sale should be done well in advance of the actual time what that would you're you ready say? to sell. How many months, how many years in advance? I mean, I think at least a year out, you have to start looking at the bigger picture. You know, having your CPA look at everything. Do your books need to be cleaned up? Are your contracts in order? What else can you do over the next 12 months to add value and improve sales? Those are the, a minimum of a year. It's probably even a longer time frame than that to really, if you really want to add value to what you're doing, but to at least get yourself organized and, and look good to a potential buyer who's going to be requesting all these things from you in due diligence at least a year to get yourself in the right position. So I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, no, that's very well well said. And I think a lot of people get so excited about the the prospect of owning a business, making money that they don't think about the end. And you know, we're not no one's gonna be on this earth forever. And whether it's transitioning the the business to a family member or, or selling, you gotta think about all this up front. And especially when you're when you're closer to it, and, and whether that's a year or even even more time, get your ducks yeah. in, in order is it's going to change the valuation uh, of what someone's willing to pay for your business. No doubt. And you also have to have obviously a dialogue with the franchisor and go back and check your franchise agreement to make sure you can even exit at all. Yes. Right. Uh, we talked about, you know, the franchisor may have rights to acquire your business from you. So you have to go back and look at that. If, if you are going to sell, Maybe your franchisor could even find you a buyer so that you don't have to list it with a business broker. Maybe they've had a lot of inquiries and somebody that would love to take over your territory. And next thing you know, they're making a connection for you. So that dialogue has to be there as well. Yeah. For franchisees selling, I usually say, you know, if you have a good relationship with the franchisor, franchisor, franchisees in adjacent areas, and then a business broker, because it's going to happen much yes. faster. And usually you're going to get a better right. valuation with people that already know yeah. the brand well, where if you go the business broker route, it's probably going to be like around six months. That's the average to sell a business, list it online, have them push it out. So it can be a lot faster if someone that you already have a relationship.
Right. And uh, you brought up an interesting point that it's not, it's not just the first franchise agreement you sign, but after five years, 10 years, 20 years, or say you bought an existing one and the agreement's coming due in two years. So you have to sign a new one. There is a franchise bright star that's in litigation against their, their franchisees because on the recent renewals, they included a buyback provision where they could buy, I think at like three times EBITDA, but the market value is okay. higher than that. So franchise yeah. franchisees are pretty upset and it wasn't sure. in their original franchise agreement, but it's in this version. And I think a lot of them gleaned over then probably someone was like, wait, was this say, isn't right. I was going to say, and I bet nobody happened to point it out, right? Exactly. Yeah. Cause you, you don't, you think that the franchisor has your best, in, your best intention. And I think most of the brands it's like that, but for different reasons, the, the terms can change every time you're signing a new document. Contracts always need to be reviewed before you sign. No, good rule of thumb in life, right? Yeah. Well, Josh, I really appreciate having you on. And what's the best Thanks, way Patrick. to get in contact with you? Whether it's a someone that's looking to buy a franchise, buy an existing business, or we have a lot of listeners that are franchisees and they're, and they're looking to sell. What's the best way to, to contact you? So office number is 215-832-3600. My email is josh at lawmr.com. Reach out anytime. We love speaking to franchisees or business owners and um, happy to help anyone or just have a conversation to kind of give our thoughts. And we're here as a resource. And thanks for having me, Patrick. This was great. No, we'll I do really it again enjoyed sometime. it. I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners learned a ton. Love to hear that. We'll do it again sometime soon. Let's do it. Thanks, Josh. Take care, Patrick. Bye.